Spot to Engineer for Impact, a show helping engineers learn and think more about how they can have a positive social impact with their careers. In this episode, I talk to Federico Speziale, a co-founder at High Impact Professionals. Fede started his career as an engineer, so we discuss why he thinks engineers are particularly good project founders, as well as his experience of going through charity entrepreneurship's incubation program to start high impact professionals. We also cover some of the limitations that professionals face when trying to increase their impact and potential mitigation strategies, as well as the support that high impact professionals provides working professionals to help them maximize their impact. You'll find show notes with valuable resources related to this episode and ways to support the podcast at engineeredforimpact.show forward slash fede. That's F-E-D-E. If you enjoy this episode, be sure to subscribe, leave us a review or comment and share it with your friends or colleagues. So without further ado, here's Fede. I'm Federico and I'm the co-founder of High Impact Professionals. And this is a new, new non-profit that has a mission to help uh, people in the private sector to find opportunities for impact. And yeah, before that, um, well, I, I'm an engineer by training and I was working as an engineer for a few years before moving to the nonprofit sector. And that, that's probably why I'm here as well. Terrific. So what precipitated that change to the nonprofit sector? Yeah, so I think a, a few things, um, if we take maybe also like the the like zoom out view i think i was very focused on my work for the first two years so i worked for about four years for this tech startup and i was really focused on my work for the first two years so not a lot of time to do anything else and but then this bug that i had okay i want to have an impact with my career as well more directly than what i was having in my previous work then i okay i took a step back and after two years um basically i reduced my work rate to 80 percent and so I, I started what I called my own 20% project, kind of stealing this concept from Google. And uh, I would invest every Friday to try to figure out how to have an impact in my career. And I think having this British space was very important. Maybe I didn't know at the time, but I think it was very important to what happened next. Um, during this 20% project, I discovered 80,000 hours. I also discovered EA, started reading some book by Will McCaskill and others. And, uh, and yeah, I think this was really the starting point and like a few things happened there. I started donating 10% of my salary. I also kind of realized that maybe like the pure technical engineer I was doing was not um, my best chance to have an impact down the line. And so I, I think it was very interesting for me to come across this concept of career capital. So I, I really reframe also the work I was doing, not only uh, I was just doing my job as an engineer, but I was also preparing myself to have more impact down the line. So how can, can you optimize the work you're doing um, to learn useful skills, uh, to, to build credentials or success stories? And, and in a sense, you know, like fourth component of career capital also to have some runway, um, to have some financial flexibility to then um, do something down the line. So I think this was like um, the inception. And so um, I also started to uh, promote some uh, initiative um, in, in the, the workplace, like fundraising event at the end of the year, talking uh, about TA, promoting effective giving, etc. And um, and yeah, and also maybe to re-elaborate a bit on so the career capital uh, side, I was also try to um, differentiate a bit what I was doing and I tried to learn a bit more about project management, product management, um, even a bit of HR, <laughs> strange enough for an engineer. Um, so things that I thought might be more applicable to a, um, to a high impact job uh, down the line. So this was the maybe maybe uh, I took it a bit like too, starting a bit too early, but yeah, this I think was was a very important pivot point of my life. And then the second one was um, after two more years of differentiating a bit and learning um, new skills. I think um, the learning curve was flattening again, and so I was starting considering, okay, what next? And then I got this email. Uh, hey, apply to the child entrepreneurship incubation program and say, yeah, I always thought about entrepreneurship as something that might be interesting for me and I want to have an impact. So child entrepreneurship doesn't make, kind of make sense. I just apply without overthinking about it and just took a step at a time. And, um, and you know, then I got into a program and uh, I started a new org. So um, sometimes I feel like 
I, I think a lot about stuff and do all these models and prioritization and sometimes just about being at the right place at the right time and, and seizing the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely a lot to being in, just in the right place at the right time, but also having put yourself in a position to, to make the most of that opportunity as well, which it sounds like you had been doing from from spending that that 20% of your, your work time for a couple of years actually building that career capital. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think two two things. You you want to be ready in terms of maybe the skill you have, and you also want to be ready in terms of knowing what you're looking for. I think it's very important to figure out what you're looking for. And then when the opportunity arises, it seems like you know it's the right opportunity. So you're ready to seize it. So I'm, I'm not saying um, maybe I came across before, I'm not saying that all the this prioritization work and trying to figure out what you want to do is not important. Um, but maybe it doesn't work that you do the, the your prioritization work, career planning, whatever, and then you immediately have an opportunity. Maybe you know just you need to be wait and and uh, so be ready and wait for for uh, for the opportunity to come. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, what sort of how did you sort of go about figuring out what your priorities were? I mean, just taking the time to think about it is already like a, a great start. I remember, I remember. Um, Again, about the time, like two years into the company, I remember taking a day off and going in the mountains, just like spending a day uh, thinking about it and really, you know, what what are my options? Um, and really thinking, I remember thinking very broadly, you know, like, should I stay in this company? Yes, no. If I stay in this company, what should I do? I, I even consider, should, should I learn how to do sales, whatever, like really very broad. Um, so I think, I think taking the time and thinking about it is already like a great starting point. And I think it was something that was missing the first two years when I was doing 150% of my job and, 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 and not thinking about it. Um, otherwise, also, um, you know, talking to people, I think is also very useful. It's a, it's, a, it's a first step of getting feedback from the real world. I think it's, it's, it's very important to think about what you want, but also it's very important to get a reality check on what you think you want and your plans. And the first step is to talk about people and maybe people say, yeah, you're crazy, never going to work, maybe. Um, people think it's a good idea. And I'm not saying you should listen too much about what other people say and get discouraged, um, but you're also like taking feedback and trying to um, yeah, see what they have to say. And, and I think that the last part of um, getting feedback is really to do test, test your ideas. And I think for me, um, so when I applied for the incubation program for two months, I could test whether this entrepreneurship thing was for me. Um, and, and, uh, and then I kind of like it. So, uh, I didn't commit it immediately to kind of quitting my job and, and starting something, but I had the chance to test it, which was, which was very good. Yeah, for sure. So to linger on, on charity, charity entrepreneurship for a moment, um, so charity entrepreneurship helps to launch high impact nonprofits, um, uh, that have potential to become field leaders. Uh, and be, becoming some of the most effective charities uh, in their their domain, um, they do most of this through their incubation program, which you are a part of. So, um, I was wondering if you could sort of talk to, about your experience going through that incubation program. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe discla- a bit of a disclaimer. I, I, I'm really a big fan of the incubation program. I think it was the, one of the best thing I did in my life. Like the for many reasons. So first of all, like how it changed my trajectory, uh, my career trajectory, and now it allowed me to almost like, you know, shift gears in my quest for impact. So I, I think this was very valuable, but also like the program itself, like was super high quality. I learned a ton in a very short amount of time, met uh, a bunch of great people as well. And, and now I'm still part of, of, uh, of this community of entrepreneurs, of people that, you know, uh, put their money where their mouth is, so to speak, and, you know, um, uh, act on their uh, beliefs and their aspiration to do good. So I think it was, was really like an excellent experience. And in terms of, um, uh, you know, it also allowed me to uh, make, meet my co-founder, which I would never have met otherwise. And I think we have a great relationship, it's a great fit. Um, and I think it was also like a confidence boost. I probably would never have started Heimberg Professional without them. Um, although I think maybe, my personality is suitable for entrepreneurship. I think it's, it's um, you know, it requires a bit of um, confidence to take the leap of faith. And I think uh, 
definitely provides that. Yeah. What, what was there anything that sort of held you back from taking that leap of faith when you got that, that email or that message encouraging you to apply for their incubation program? I think, I think not really because it was a, like a step-by-step -step process. So I think it would be very daunting to say, okay, I want to start, um, I want to do a startup, like a charity startup. Okay. But what, what, what idea should I focus on? Um, I need to find a co-founder. I need to find funding. Where do I start? So it's really, it's really daunting and it's really difficult as well. So I think the incubation program provided all the elements you need. Um, one thing which is also quite unique is also they do research on, um, on the most impactful ideas. So, uh, I would always joke with friends as well, since university is like, okay, wh when do we start our own startup? Right. Um, and, but the, the point was, okay, but what do we do? I don't know, like, let's start a startup. <laughs> and, um, and so I think it's great that they also provide idea and I think there's also a very big confidence. Boost. So what I'm working on has been restoring research and compared with other ideas. So I'm not just like my fantasy, but there's a bit more backing and, um, yes. And I think, so you apply and then you go step by step and every step of the process, you can think about whether you like it or not. I think also the application process itself was a great way to figure it out. And then if you get into the program, like you just do a two months program to start with. And, and then it, it felt kind of natural. So by the, by the end of the process, I, I, by, I felt ready, you know, it was uh, maybe six months or a bit more, six or eight months since from application to then starting. Um, hiring a professional, I kind of felt ready. I don't think you're never ready. You know, it's a lot of figuring out when you're starting uh, uh, a new organization and uh, by no means like two months of learning is enough to learn whatever you need to learn. But again, it felt like a reasonable step to do. Definitely. Um, were there any particular um, skills that you sort of bought into that from your career that you think uh, might you know, that if people are listening and think they might be able to bring in those sort of skills that might be particularly valuable for entering the, the charity entrepreneurship incubation program? Yeah, so I think, and I might be a bit biased, you know, um, because I'm an engineer myself, but I think that the engineering skill set can be very useful to start new ventures. And I remember this thing stuck in my head, I think it was an article by the Washington Post, and they say, 34 of the top 100 CEOs in the world as, are engineers. So I, if I understood correctly, like engineers is the biggest group and MBAs is just, just below that. So it's crazy to say that, uh, uh, you know, business administration, people that study this are not the, the most successful one, but engineers are. Well, now I may be paraphrasing a bit more. And, um, but yeah, I think, I think the, uh, the engineering mindset is really important, you know, like this, creating things from scratch. And I'm currently reading, for example, the Lean Startup, which I highly recommend to all that want to start a new project. And really the main point there is like, you should treat everything as an experiment, you know, define your hypothesis. Uh, what are you trying to validate? How do you measure what you want to measure? Uh, how do you build an experiment to measure what you need to measure? And it's like, wait a minute, this sounds familiar, you know, like, Whenever you're developing a product, this, this was, was what I was doing um, in my previous job as well. You know, making sure that um, things were working as they were supposed to be, and getting data. You know, don't not trusting um, your warm fuzzy feeling, but um, uh, yeah, but but getting real data. So I think there are a lot of um, of of useful things that come from from engineering as well. I think it was also useful to um, diversify a bit, uh, as I mentioned before, like learning other stuff. Um, I feel like. You know, after five or six years, how long, however long an engineering study is, plus some work, I think you got most of what you need to learn. Of course, to become a specialist, you can work like 20 years in the same field and still have things to learn. But in terms of like the basics, uh, you probably get them quite quickly. So kind of diversify and put other things on the radar. I think it was also um, quite useful. And, um, and in general, I think nowadays being tech savvy is important. Everything is... Uh, is kind of technology related. You can automate stuff. So um, I think that, that's definitely quite useful. Maybe things that common pitfalls that for, for me and potentially for engineers as well, I think 
I think I'm too focused on kind of quality, very high quality when, when you kind of develop a product or like a system, it needs to be perfect. Or I think this is how I was taught in university as well. So um, there was a lot of mathematics as well in my study. So mathematics is like perfect. It's not like just approximation. So you want to do things perfect. And I think this, first of all, there is no such thing as perfect. And secondly, it's way too slow. So uh, kind of, uh, I think this was a, um, was a bit of a drawback here. And so kind of make more mistakes, almost like a, uh, as a mantra and, and getting, because when you make mistakes, you get feedback from, from the real world. And I really like the, um, the story of, of, uh, you know, SpaceX versus NASA. So NASA is, is, is a uh, conventional engineering. They do 15 years of development and, and, and they test everything. And usually everything works fine that they very rarely have mishaps. And then on the other hand, you have SpaceX and they blow a rocket every second week. Uh, this kind of like, yeah, let's, let's do it. Let's put something together and do it and get real data instead of like, just thinking about it. And, uh, you know, guess who is, uh, supplying the international space station at the moment, you know? So, um, I think, I think this was something that, um, for me was, was like a learning process as well. And maybe like another pitfall is as engineers, we are fascinated by the technical solutions and by the product, but you should really focus on the problem. So what is the problem you're trying to fix? Not, not getting, uh, getting fascinated by something you're developing and then just trying to, uh, to, you know, to develop a solution, try to find the problem. I think this is a bit the other way around. Yeah, definitely. It's, um, it's very easy to get caught up in the kind of the fun and magic of creating something and lose sight of why you're actually there creating it and what value you're trying to bring and, and to who you're trying to bring that value to. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. So let's change track a little bit and, uh, talk about high impact professionals. So this is the organization that you helped to found as part of the charity entrepreneurship incubation program. Um, you've described high impact professionals as working effective altruists who understand that their main path to impact is outside of their current day job. So, uh, to give my definition of effective altruism, uh, it, it's a philosophy and a community aiming to identify the world's most pressing problems and solving them using uh, data and evidence to inform, inform actions and decisions. So I think there's quite a few engineers in our audience who are in this situation of being working professionals who are eager to, to learn a bit about how they can increase the impact they can have uh, with their careers. So. I was wondering if you could elaborate on some of the paths to impact for high impact professionals. Yeah. So I think, I think we identified three main paths that should more or less capture all the activities that people, uh, people could do. So and the first path is pretty, um, well known in the EA community, which is, you know, contributing with your money. Uh, so this kind of notion of, of earning to give. And, uh, I mean, if you, if you happen to live in a high income country, your ability to earn money is almost like a superpower. You, you are earning n times more than the uh, the world average or, or, or median. So it's really something which is potentially one of your um, unique selling proposition, right? So I think this is like a this is like a good starting point. For me personally, it was never like the end game. So it was like because I can, I would just donate. Um, but I feel it can be, can be hard to, uh, I heard a lot. It can be hard to get motivated by your donation kind of like impersonal. And so, um, I think I felt the same for me and, and I heard from many people as well, but if you can, I mean, it's, it's an excellent way to, to, to have an impact as well. The, the second pillar or path that we identified is to contribute with your skills. So either trying to contribute like with pro bono work um, or, or like advising in a sense, or also like transition to direct work. Um, before you mentioned um, our, our definition, which uh, I believe we wrote also in our project proposal back in the days of people that are working and con consider it as like, as a side track, this impact thing. And I think that we also maybe evolve a bit our vision and, and we think that there is also a lot of potential for people to kind of change jobs as well and can be highly impactful. 
And in the third path to impact um, that we identify is promoting more impactful initiatives in the workplace. So, and this is kind of very similar to what I was doing in my previous companies, which is quite, um, quite, uh, quite uh, funny as well. So you can donate X amount of money per year. If, if you can convince your colleagues to do the same, they say you're not like a multiplier. So if you, if you work in an organization and you can make an organization move, is much, the, the, the reach is much bigger than, than what you could do yourself. So um, in the past, um, we, we help people running fundraising events in their, in their workplace for the giving season. Um, we know that um, one consulting firm was able to push for a, for a, for a policy that all employees uh, would donate 1% of their salary by default, opt out. And this is, again, like a great way to, to multiply your impact. And, um, and yeah, so there are, there are many ways in which you can, you can bring impact also in, in your workplace. And I think, roughly speaking, these are the three main buckets uh, that we identified uh, as path for impact for professionals. Yeah, really interesting. Um, you mentioned there that you sort of updated your thinking around uh, your definition of high impact professionals. Uh, what, yeah. what sort of led to that update? Yeah, I mean, also getting um, getting exposed to both professionals and organization, and, and um, seeing and understanding what they need, but also in a sense running some numbers. So, um, like a, a career change can be very valuable, and maybe is is a uh, it can be hard to match the same uh, level of impact through what what I call sometimes like in, indirect ways. So you you work. You have your full-time job, and then you try to contribute uh, in your spare time. Um, you know, if you can, if you can work 100% on 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 impact, it, it is likely, it is plausible that that you're gonna potentially have a have a bigger impact. But I think I think I think direct work is is not like the silver bullet. It, so it can be very impactful. But I also uh, I've also seen example of people in the in the in the private sector that are having like a big impact. I would say maybe bigger than than most. Um, you know, people donating a lot, um, advising as well. Um, I mean, one of our um, our seed funding so um, came half from child entrepreneurship and half from a, a private donor, and so probably would not have existed without the support of a of a. Of, of this private donor working in the private sector. Yeah, that's terrific. Yeah, one of the things I've heard from a few of High Impact Engineers members is sort of a, a frustration around wanting to be able to transition to, to more directly impactful work, but having financial obligations around your family and mortgages that really restrict their ability to to sort of take uh, or make more risky career transitions uh, whether it's you know trying to start up their own project or jumping on a new project that's a little bit uncertain and yeah maybe its future isn't super certain or even just taking a bit of a an income drop to be able to go work at a nonprofit, for example when uh, perhaps their financial situation doesn't sort of allow for that um have you got any thoughts on how people who are in positions such as that can maximize their impact given their constraints? Yeah, I definitely, I definitely have, I definitely have some thoughts there. It was also like um, a question for me when I, when I changed career. Um, maybe a caveat: I don't have a lot of financial obligation yet in terms of like family and mortgages. So I, I just share my thoughts, and and, uh, and people are gonna see whether they make sense for them or not. So first of all, I think not is like not necessarily like changing to high impact job job is like requires a salary cut. So I saw quite a few positions in, in the year space as well that, that are paying better than what I was earning before as an engineer. So I think this is like important to to point out. And um, the second thing that at least it worked for me is so you can try to engineer your life to to be more flexible and, and, and leaner in a way. Um, 
so uh, I think the, the notion also like personal finance is very important. Um, how, how do you manage your finance finances? Um, and I think it's often a matter of being smart rather than making big sacrifices. Um, I mean, like a personal example, recently, um, recently moved to a new flat and there were options which were like 50% more expensive or, or, and now we are like perfectly happy here. I think it was a very good choice. It's just a matter of like uh, maybe looking a bit more and having these are criteria. And, uh, you know, especially big and recurring expenses add up at the end of the, at the end of the year. So, um, and also for me, again, focus on, on the three, four biggest items on your budget, which probably uh, make up 80% of the expenses. Try to optimize those by creating some systems. So for example, now I'm in a new flat, which I like, and I don't need to think about it. And, and this kind of like reduce my living expenses at the same time, right? And, and then forget about the rest, you know, when you do grocery, when you go out for, for dinner as well. So um, yeah, I think you can prepare yourself maybe we were talking about career capital and runway is part of the career capital. So while you're working, you can maybe maybe put some money on the side and maybe try to optimize a bit your life to uh, to be able to uh, make this change down the line. It was definitely the case for me. So I was I was working for for a few years. Um, you know, I was trying to keep a, a lean lifestyle. You know, sharing my flat and I had no car and and then you know I had some money on the side, and so for me it was was not a big. Uh, a big deal to you know take two months off i think also like took some unpaid leave to do the course um and then change to to a job which had less financial maybe stability and i think i think um it's even more so for for my co-founder so i think we, we both we both have we both had some money on the side um thanks to our previous careers and, and this allowed allowed us to uh, yeah to be a pretty safe in, in that regard and, and not to uh, put too many also like financial stress on the hiring professionals as well. I don't, I don't know if I'm answering the question, but yeah, this is the, the way I, I went about it. Yeah, it's an interesting way to go about it, I think, because uh, talking to a friend who is sort of in a, in a similar situation where, you know, they've got a, a career that pays relatively well, and they've been able to use that as an opportunity to to spend, you know, two two to three days a week, actually starting their own project or volunteering their time or or considering how they can maximize their impact. Similar to to what you did before you joined the incubation program, um, and it seems like while it won't work for everybody in, in all situations, it might be a safer and sort of less risky option for people to start transitioning to direct work by just sort of pulling back the amount of full-time work they're doing um, by maybe even just a day or a half day um, or seeing if they can work out some sort of, you know, um, nine-day fortnight type situation with their employer, which I know is uh, possible for, for some employers. Uh, and just being able to get that time and the space to sort of put dedicated time towards thinking about your impact and working towards increasing that. Perhaps you could outline some of the ways that high impact professionals is is going about helping professionals to maximize their their positive impact. Sure. So I think the, um, I think I already mentioned before, but the best way to describe what we're doing is we are helping professionals finding opportunities for impact. And uh, as all startups, you know, we are experimenting with things that might um, might work. So, for example, in the last um, in our history, we helped people running fundraising events in their career. We supported uh, workplace and professional groups, um, kind of creating EA groups within organization. We also supported um, kind of organization in, in recruiting a bit. This is something we are also doing at the moment a bit. Um, and uh, yeah, at the moment we are. We just launched what we call like a talent directory. So whoever might consider maybe changing um, jobs to, to, to work for a high impact nonprofit can sign up to the directory and then recruiters from those nonprofit are going to look at, the, um, at, this, at this directory and then maybe reach out to people that might be interested in, in changing jobs. And I think this can 
the vision a bit, if, if the instruction is also maybe to expand, maybe like people that want to, to do volunteering, people that want to do pro bono work. So all the different ways that I um, mentioned before that people can contribute to help EA orgs, uh, we hope to, to facilitate as well. And um, uh, in the pipeline, we have um, also some sort of like fellowships. I think there are many fellowships and it's a bit like a fuzzy term, but the idea is really to um, help professionals translate their knowledge of EA to action. So really some like an, an action uh, driven fellowship. But this is also something that we still need to plan and strategize a bit. Just want to give a bit of an outlook. Yeah, terrific. Um, have there been any sort of trends that you've seen through your discussions with working professionals about common needs or common problems that they're facing when, when considering increasing their impact? Yeah, so I think one of the main problem, and I, I'm not sure if it's that stated, but definitely something that we saw is really people are busy, at, you know, like work. And then, you know, the older you grow, the more commitments you have, like work, family, et cetera. So I think the lack of time was was definitely one of the main, um, you know, one of the main theme that we uh, that we identified. This The second one, is probably maybe lack of opportunity and lack of knowledge of how how to help uh, orgs. And I think, so this is something that hopefully we might help out also in the future. Um, maybe you want to volunteer or maybe you want to do some pro bono work, but orgs don't have, uh, don't have the time to, to, to define work packages. And so I think, I think there are, um, there are not many, many opportunities to, so yeah, donation is, is easy. Everybody will accept your money. Um, changing work to like direct work. I wouldn't say it's easy, but like the path is clear. So you, they have, they have a, the also organization know how to do it. They have an opening, they do outreach, they have an application process, then they hire. Um, a bit of the drawback is, you know, if a hundred people apply, only one is, is, is hired. So definitely, there is a, a, a the, the demand and supply problem there, but at least like the process is clear. And then for the rest, it's a bit less clear. So if you want to do pro bono work, is a is kind of a bit less clear how we could do it. If you want to be an advisor, again, it's, it's less clear how, how we could do it. So I think there is um, there is some work to do in developing opportunities for 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 professionals. And I think now I change from what are the problems. Of, of working professional to what are uh, you know our challenges <laughs> i don't know if i shifted there too much but um yeah well, i guess uh their problems your problems to solve in exactly a sense. exactly yeah the, the time one seems quite difficult uh to be able to solve because we've had we've had a couple of our members have the same thing where they're just really busy with work and they're they're thinking about impact but maybe the most they can do is, is read a newsletter once a month or uh, occasionally look through a website or something like that. But otherwise, they're just uh, they're just busy. They've got work to do and they've got family and they've got uh, more just, yeah, just a lot of things on their plate. Um, yeah. have, you, have you seen or come across anybody who's sort of successfully navigated that or, or made attempts to navigate that? Yeah, I think I think it's very it's very it's very challenging. Um, again, like roughly speaking, how can you contribute to to um, you know nonprofits? So it's either through money, donation, or through time. So I think there is there is uh, there are those two two things. So if you can't make the time, I think well the donation path is always open to you. But if you can't make the time, I think can be uh, you know. It can be it can be tricky, and I think it, it can be interesting to. Are you able to take some time off? So if 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 your time is, is if your week is full with work and and family, um, I'm, I'm sure maybe people don't spend enough time with family, so you don't want to cut that. But can you can you maybe reduce uh, the time, the time that you're working? Can you go eighty percent? Can you go ninety percent? Um, this probably can be like a, a an interesting discussion as well and 
one thing that I, I think might be promising, like a lot of companies have pro bono work. So you can take time, you can take work time to do pro bono projects. And so I think this could be a, a way around that. If you can use company time to do pro bono work, I think this could, could, this could help. Um, although often it's not really like the working hours you have to make, but the, the deadlines you have to, to, to achieve. So, um, maybe it's not really about the time, but about the, the goals that you have. So yeah, it's, yeah, it's definitely a challenge. I don't think I have a, a silver bullet for that. Yeah, it's definitely a tough one. Have you got any recommendations for how people can find pro bono work? Again, um, very interesting question and to which I don't have like a great answer. Um, so I think, I think the volunteering can be, um, a great way for organization to get skills that they might not have, um, in the moment, for example, we publish this, this time directory. Um, we, I, we need to do some, uh, user interface, some front end. So, we would definitely use it could use like someone knowing JavaScript for, for a few hours and um, but often we don't have the time to, to search. So I think like the time directory could help. So if, if you list yourself there as, as open to pro bono work and volunteer, which you can do. And actually I did I use it my I use my own I use our own time directory to maybe reach out to some people that might want to help us in JavaScript. So I think this is um, one way. So this hopefully is gonna help. Um, uh, help people and but i think there, there, there's really a need to work with with organization as well to maybe um convince them of the value of, of of volunteering and maybe helping them defining work packages and and uh and uh you know um helping them outsourcing tasks which is, is not is not easy you know it requires you need to step back and define work packages it requires a bit of management bandwidth which a lot of work you maybe don't have so i think it can be very promising also, in, in a way of like an engagement tool, we had a, a, quite a few volunteers that volunteer with us and now are working full time. So both as a way to try before you buy, but also like to build your reputation within the movement as well. So I think there is there is quite some potential there. I haven't seen many examples of, of, of like orgs that have really like cracked the, the, the volunteering problem and, and were able to do it successfully. I think we did try as well um, back in the days to work with some volunteers. And I think we didn't do a great job. We didn't have the, the, the management bandwidth to, to, to manage them uh, properly. So mostly we were not able to um, provide a good experience and, and in return maybe uh, getting, getting useful work. Um, we, we, saw, we saw notable exceptions. So we also worked with some volunteers uh, and they really were able to help us a lot. But yeah, it's a bit hit and miss. Yeah, I've heard from from a few other people as well, the volunteering programs, like running a volunteering program as a nonprofit manager is, is a challenge. And there's, yeah, it's not as, it's not as simple as it seems at, on face value. Yeah. Yeah. Do you feel that there's any common misconceptions that professionals have about, or that might be holding them back from being able to achieve their full impact? I think there are some common misconceptions and one of which maybe we already discussed is like the the financial side of things. Again, maybe this is biased to my personal experience, but you know, realizing that that you you don't need that much, and you know, it's totally possible to have a an impactful work and having enough, you know, to pay the bills, but also to to put money aside for pension and everything, right? So I think this is one that we already discussed. Another one I would say is. A lot, I, I think a few people think that their skill set is not useful um, to the to the, the nonprofit sector, and that um, you know they they, they can't they don't have the skills to contribute. And I remember um, I remember one of the conferences, and one guy working in HR for for a big tech company, and it was a bit I wouldn't say like self conscious, but yeah, what is my skill set? What can I do with my skill set? And and then after a while realizing because many people told told him you know that you might be the most experienced hr professional in this whole conference of 1500 people like oh wow oh yeah and and and, and nonprofits also do have to hire talent retain talent and and so um definitely very useful and another similar case another person like doing business development and say yeah what what 
what can I do with my business development background? And yeah, a lot of people being also like a lot of uh, very interesting in, in his background as well. So um, maybe like related to that, like another misconception is that the for-profit and non-profit sector is very different. And uh, again, maybe biased by my own experience and, you know, I, I don't have 20 years of experience in the non-profit sector, uh, but I think, you know, running an organization is, is very similar. Different bottom lines, yes, but, you know, um, we're hiring people, managing a team, setting goals, defining a strategy. I mean, all those things are very, are very cross applicable. So I think those are a few misconceptions that come to mind. Yeah. Reading, um, reading for profit entrepreneurial books and following sort of, yeah, thought leaders on, uh, YouTube or LinkedIn or wherever you sort of follow those types of people, definitely a lot of those skills are directly applicable in the nonprofit space. Absolutely. Yeah. So you mentioned previously how, uh, that you personally ran some workplace giving or, or fundraising programs before starting high impact professionals. And that was one of the early programs that you tested out. Um, what were the results of running that program? Yeah. So I think my personal experience was quite, um, positive. So I think we did it for two years in a row and we raised between 10 and 25 K um, US dollar per year in a small company of a hundred people. So I think maybe this is not like big, if you think like the company budget, but this is definitely big compared to my, you know, my personal donation. So it was definitely like a way for me to, uh, five X or 10 X my, my, my personal donation as well. So I think quite a good experience for me personally in terms of in terms of um helping other people to to organize it i think we had some example of of like very very successful 200k plus counterfactual in one case 60k 30k 20k 40k so i think we had quite a few few example of, of people pulling it off uh, quite nicely of course there's also like a distribution um, other other events not being so successful, but I think I think that as as a year working professional, this can be a very interesting way to uh, to multiply your impact, especially if you consider like the, the amount of time it takes to organize. So it takes anywhere anywhere between I think I don't know five maybe on average maybe twenty hours five to whatever forty like the, the big this distribution. And uh, if you divide that by by uh, the, the the money you raised, again you've got 100, 200, 500 dollars per hour. So 500 dollars of impact, 500 dollars of counterfactual impact per hour, which seems very very interesting to me. So if if it's uh, if it's something that you think might work in your company, um, then I think it's definitely something worth considering. And it's also like a way to often effective giving is, is a, is a, is a way into then talk about effectiveness more in general, like effective altruism. So I think this could be like some, um, flow to effect there as well. Yeah, for sure. How do you typically recommend people go about, uh, starting a fundraising campaign in their organization? Well, we, we have a, we have a bunch of resources on our website as well. Um, and so I think we, we have, and we, we hopefully have everything you need to, to do it, like from like, what is the process? You know, you need to, you need to, you know, get company approval. You need to, you know, select charities and, and define the messaging, doing your campaign, following up, measuring impact. So we, we have like, you have that, you have uh, like slide decks, resources, key factors for impact. So I think we, we have a lot of resources to, to help people, um, help people navigate that and, um, yeah, depending depending on the on the company environment can be can be also like quite easy. And again, probably a bit biased from my own experience, but in my case, it was quite easy to uh, to uh, set those things up, and and uh, and it was good good impact as well. And maybe another side benefit is that you also build your credentials within EA. So you show them that you can create new stuff uh, from scratch and you know that you have uh, you know this entrepreneurial spirit and um i i had this intuition that what i was doing at my previous company was also like a factor when i was 
um, accepted to incubation program. And then I, I, I said to myself, well, I don't need to use my intuition. I can ask. And so I asked them, was this a factor? Was this a positive factor for me? And they say, yeah, definitely, yes. Uh, we like people that have side projects and create things from scratch. And if those things are also in the altruistic uh, like space, then it's even better. Yeah, that's awesome. It's definitely, it's in, in terms of side projects, it seems like one that you can definitely work into your your day-to-day work schedule pretty pretty easily, I'd imagine, just by sending some emails and uh, doing a bit of reading and trying to get the, the ball rolling on uh, a company-based giving program. Yeah, absolutely. And especially, I mean, the hope, and again, probably biased because we are doing that, uh, but especially if you if if you if, if you already have this slide deck, so usually some so there are two ways. Either you do like only like a message based campaign, and you're like messaging to a, the company, and and we have some message, messages there as well, some templates. Or you do like a bit, like a short pitch. Uh, maybe you 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 hijack the last five minutes of a company meeting and and you pitch a bit the ideas of effective giving. And again, there we have some slides. So I think. I think in general, it's not like a huge amount of work. And especially if you have maybe like a starting point, um, it can be, it can be yeah, something even, you know, lowering the activation energy and making it easier for people. Yeah, for sure. And I bet it feels pretty good as well when, uh, when it pays off. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I was the, f- the first time we, we did it with a few colleagues at work, we raised $25,000. It was like blown away. It's like, wow. Yeah, that's awesome. So since you've started high impact professionals, it seems like there have been a lot of profession specific community build, uh, building organizations, uh, similar to what high impact engineers is, um, there's high impact medicine, the EA consultants network, um, to, to name a few, what do you see high impact professionals advantage being? In that they're sort of industry agnostic and some, and can operate a- across sort of this spectrum of professions. Yeah, so I think I have a few thoughts here. Um, first of all, before we started, um, as you said, there was almost nothing, uh, so professionals were a bit neglected, I guess. So I think that there is a good thing that more and more initiatives are created to support uh, professionals. So I think in general is good. Um, similarly, in you know, in the for-profit startup world, there's this saying that if there is no competition, there is no market. And I think that like the uh, the nice thing about EA is that we are not in competition, but there is a lot of correlation, which I love. But again, I think if a lot of people try similar things, it means that maybe there is a need. So again, there's a bit of like um, validation there. And I also think that it's good for maybe different players to to test different approaches. And 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 see what works and what doesn't. So, yeah, I, th- I think it's, it's not it's not necessarily like negative that we have multiple orgs, especially this early stage. I think it's very useful the the, the the exploration and the value information. And in terms of more kind of specifically, what is an advantage of of like a profession agnostic organization is that you can maybe leverage. Um, the, the overlap. I think there's a lot of overlap. So if you, there's some specific about the profession, but otherwise, you know, like if you talk about donations, I think it's very similar to if you talk to a doctor or if you talk to to an engineer. If you talk about maybe like trying to influence organization again, it's, it's pretty similar. So I think we can leverage those um, those those synergies as well. We also maybe a bit more flexible to. I don't know if you, if we if you talk to a group, we can spe- spe- specifically discuss some topics and maybe like our priorities change, and so we can kind of kind of change group and go wherever we think the 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 biggest impact is. So I think those are are the benefit. Maybe the disadvantages and the benefit of of a profession specific group is that um, there is always value in focus as well. So if you focus only on one group, you can make prob- most probably serve it better. Um, because you're, you're not spread out across multiple groups. And also maybe there is this um, being part of, of, a, of a, a tighter group. So it's not just professional. Professional is a pretty big group, you know, like in engineers as well, but it's very like a bit smaller, for example, and maybe people can, can relate to each other, can relate to each other a bit better. Yeah, so I, 
I, I'm not unsure whether which approach is, is the best. And I think it's, it's nice for people to try it out and, and uh, discover new stuff and, and maybe in a few few months, a few years, um, understanding which one is better and maybe then double down on what works best. Yeah, for sure. I think in terms of having both like the professional agnostic and then professional specific community building organizations, it seems to me like it's definitely a case of, you know, uh, the sum of the whole being greater than the sum of the parts, because, you know, we're able to, to build or to take inspiration from each other's work to, to refer people to, you know, whoever can help serve them best. And, uh, definitely with what, uh, you and high impact professionals has put together with the talent directory, it's, it kind of becomes that central, or it seems like it has that potential to become like a central hub for people to be able to go and sort of, yeah, find roles or find professionals. And then, yeah, uh, you can sort of really act like that switchboard in the middle of, you know, uh, directing both employers and, uh, employees or professionals to, to be able to maximize, uh, maximize their impact. Um, I definitely for us, like, you know, both Jess, Jess and I are very grateful for, for the support that, that both you and Devin, uh, as part of high impact professionals gave us in the early days of trying to get high impact engineers off the ground and figure out, yeah, what we were going to do and, and how we were going to try and make it, make a difference for engineers. So, so thank you very much for that. Yeah. Well, if, if we can help, we, we are, we are only happy. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I think in general, one thing that I really love about EA is that there is, there is a lot of really a lot of collaboration and sharing and we can learn from each other. So I think this is, uh, this is like something great. I also like the fact that it's also like some testing different approach that potentially compete for the same resources, but it's not like a competition where your loss is my gain. It's more like, let's try different things and let's talk and, and figure out what is, what is best. And if you're better suited to do what you, what, what we are we're trying to do, then probably a step down and do something else. So I think those, uh, those dynamics are very, are very useful. Really. Yeah, definitely. I know for us, we had, we ended up having a, having a list of over 40 projects that we were sort of considering and trying to figure out, you know, which ones we were going to pursue and which ones we were just going to, you know, uh, would, would fell too far down the, the list of rankings. And yeah, there's only so many, so many things that an organization can do at any one point of time. So definitely having multiple organizations trying different things and, and testing different things out and collecting collecting evidence and collecting data and trying to evaluate the most effective way to, to increase the impact of working professionals is, is a valuable thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. For you personally, how is, or what have been some of the highlights of doing this community building work and the work that you've, you've been doing at high impact professionals? I'm always very excited. So I get to talk with a lot of people that, you know, are trying one way or another doing their best to make the world a better place. So I think it's very, you know, every time I get a, like a motivational boost, you know, every time they, they talk to some, somebody and um, yeah, really also like this, this, this sharing of sharing of ideas and, and um, always, you know, as I said, it's not like a, com a competitive environment where your success is, is someone else's loss, but you know, um, you're rooting for other people's success because it's in a way so you're also your own success. We all, all have the same same goals and we don't really care who does what as long as we try to, to maximize the impact. So I think it's been very uh, yeah, a great experience and I'm enjoying it. Awesome. Yeah, it's great seeing some of the pe some of the work that people are doing and just yeah, I quite often just find myself talking to someone and just sort of sitting there in awe at you know, the work that they're, they're doing or they're, they're inspiring, uh, aspiring to do. And yeah, it's just, it's really, uh, it just gives me a ton of energy to be doing this sort of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So how can people help support the work that you're doing at high impact professionals? So we, we have, we have our time directory, so you can sign up there if you, if you think you might be interested in, in, in some. Um, you know, changing careers. But as I said, we, we may be hoping the future will be broader than that. So 
Uh, we also have some questions whether you want to do some pro bono work, be an advisor, um, and, and so I encourage you to check that out. And in general, I think our, our vision for the future is also to um, create a lot of resources for people to, to, um, to get inspired uh, by in our website. So, uh, yeah, I guess this is, uh, this is something that uh, people could do. Um, if you're interested in, in running a psych initiative in your workplace, um, you can also reach out to me. We are happy. We're very happy usually to help people uh, setting stuff up in the workplace as well. So yeah, those are a few things that, uh, that people could do. Terrific. We'll put a link to, to your website and your talent directory sign up form in the show notes for this episode. Um, what are your top three resources for people who want to learn more about how they can have an impact with their career? Yeah, so I think it really depends on, on the um, on this stage people are are in. So um, kind of early stage, maybe more. I remember for me it was very you know like doing better book for by William McCaskill was very like people tell more as well. Um, there are some websites like 8000 hours are probably good that are trying to um, help people in their career um, career choices as well and yeah hopefully soon in the future also like the high impact professionals will be like a, a hub for for people to find resources that will help them uh, maximize the impact terrific uh what do you wish you had invented and why <laughs> a machine that answered my email <laughs> <laughs> no, like joke, joke, joking aside, I, I think I think um, I think I'm uh, I'm 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 obsessed by making excellent decisions, which takes a lot of time, unfortunately. So uh, I I I would love to have a machine that in, in every moment, in every occasion, whenever I have a question, is going to point me to the optimal decision, you know, with a with a confidence interval. So and maybe th th those things are coming, you know, like chat GPT and stuff. But uh, I would just love you know, what, what is the best restaurant for me to go or like, what is the best, <laughs> what is the, what is the best thing I could do with my career? You know, like what is the best strategy for anchor professionals and you just put everything in the machine, they spits out the, the optimal answer. That's going be great. Yeah. I think if you can, if you can crack that invention, you've, there's probably, uh, probably a lot you can do with it. Yeah. And, and I mean, like, good decisions are so fundamental for so many things in life that you know if you crack that then a lot of good things could follow yeah for sure have you got any in light of that invention pending invent inventing do you have any any recommended resources for people who are interested in making better decisions yeah so um the charting chart entrepreneurship incubation program has two parts and the first part is solely dedicated to making good decisions. So they, they have a lot of, they, they explain a lot of heuristics um, on how to do that. So there is a, they have a book now uh, on uh, online on Amazon, how to start high impact nonprofit or something similar. And uh, I think that the first half is, is, uh, is very relevant, even if you don't want to start a startup. And, and I'm sure maybe they also have some, uh, um, some, uh, some tools in, on the website and some resources there too. Um, but yeah, um, point in case, half of the entrepreneurship curriculum at CE is how to make good decisions. So it seems pretty important. Yeah, for sure. Well, Fede, thank you so much for joining me today. Sean, yeah, thanks a lot for inviting me. It was a, it was a pleasure to, to chat with you. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Fede. For detailed show notes with valuable resources related to this episode, head to engineeredforimpact.show forward slash FEDE. That's F-E-D-E. -E. You can support Engineered for Impact by leaving us a review on your preferred podcasting platform, dropping us a comment on the YouTube video for this episode, or heading to our website and leaving us anonymous feedback. You can also support the show financially. Engineered for Impact is brought to you by our foundation, High Impact Engineers, organized in the USA. Head to engineeredforimpact.show to donate. Thanks for listening and happy problem solving.